Hello, and welcome to our 10th video tutorial. Today, we're going to be looking at assigning restraints, constraints, and releases and partial fixity. So first, let's start with a couple of definitions. What is a restraint? Well, a restraint is essentially what you might ordinarily think of as either a fixed condition, a pin condition, or a roller condition. So, of course, we're going to need restraints in order to restrain the bridge at the base points, here at the footings, at all these four points. So let's go ahead and select our four base points, and you select them by nodes. So uh, once you have them selected, go up to Assign, Joint, Restraints. Here you can specify what kind of restraint that you want. I would recommend using the fast restraints, since these will usually give you what you want. For example, if you wanted a fixed condition, you would restrain all translations or rotations. If you wanted a pin constraint, you would allow rotations, but constrain all translations. Similarly, with the roller, you'd be able to restrain translation in the three direction, while allowing translation to occur in the one and two directions. And if you're starting to become confused by the coordinate system laid out by this uh, here coordinate system at the bottom, x, y, and z, Essentially, there's a one-to-one -one mapping with x being the one direction, y being the two direction, and z being the three direction. So, again, if you were going to constrain translation in the three direction, you would be constraining translation in the z direction. So, to give an example of what this would look like, you can see I now have visual representations of rollers, which would appear, as you might typically think of rollers, to allow the bridge to translate in both the x and y directions, but it would limit it from translating in the z direction. Now, I would suggest for most of your analyses to use all pins for your bases. And the reason for this is because typically uh, your bases aren't necessarily going to be moving around. If you have enough weight on the bridge, then there's going to be enough frictional to resistance to prevent your uh, bases from sliding around too much. So just go ahead and say all pins for now. Now there is an important note that if you're going to be modeling your uh, base restraints, in the case of say a lateral test, you might want to reconsider this. For example, I would recommend in that instance maybe only placing pin restraints at the footings that have uh, lateral restraint devices at them, and the other ones just have roller constraints. And the reason for this is I've seen in previous years that indeed during a lateral test you can have footings that do move. So definitely consider that as you approach your design. Ah, so now what's up next? Constraints. Ah, yes. So first of all, I'd like to go off by describing what exactly is a constraint versus a restraint. Uh, the it seems kind of semantics at least, but. Uh, if you select, say, a point, and you go to the sign joint, you'll have two options, restraints and constraints. And you might be tempted to pick one over the other or wonder what the heck is the difference between these. Well, I'll just click on restraints for now. So you can see there's a drop-down list of all these different things. Uh, beam, line, weld, local, uh, body, all these different options. Now, <laughs> I have to say right off the bat, you will never, I don't think, ever have need of using constraints. And I could simply leave it at that, but I'll explain a little bit why. Now, back in the day, when we were first taught how to use SAP by Alex and Alex, uh, they pretty much selected all the points in the bridge, and then went and assigned joint constraints, and then gave it a weld constraint. This seems utterly backward now <laughs> that I have uh, I guess the knowledge that I do now. Weld constraints are not intended to link particular members together at a joint at all. In fact, welds are intended to link two disjoint members together in the event that say you had these four members coming together and maybe you had originally drawn this member such that it stopped maybe right here and didn't connect to this node. You could use a weld constraint to connect or constrain this particular node from this member that didn't connect to this point to this node in such a fashion that there would be some linkage between the way this node displaced and this node displaced. 
No, I can't really think of any instance in which that would be beneficial to you. There are a couple other instances in which constraints could be useful. However, it's highly unlikely that we'll ever need to use those cases. In particular, if you were linking, say, a shell element, which is essentially a 2D extrusion of a beam element, uh, to maybe, say, either a sh solid element, which is basically a three-dimensional element, or maybe just a frame element, a one-dimensional effectively element, then perhaps you might have need of constraints. But um, I can't really see that being useful. One other possible use for constraints would be to employ some kind of rigid body constraint. You could select multiple nodes and then specify how these two nodes would behave in accordance with certain displacement patterns. So that might be useful if you, say, wanted to disallow uh, rotation at a particular joint or uh, disallow a particular joints to displace in or rotate about a certain axis. Uh, now these are all very special cases and maybe you might do these in some kind of structures class or building design class, but for our purposes you'll never ever have to do that. So please just completely ignore doing joint constraints. Just focus on restraints. Now that was a little bit of a long-winded explanation uh, for something that you'll never use, but Please just stay away from them if you can. Now, the last thing that we're going to look at is assigning releases and partial fixity. So, oftentimes you'll find that you would like to model your bridge in a different way from what it defaults to when you first set up uh, your bridge. So, I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. So, a particular frame in a bridge, and I'll select one frame here for example, uh, essentially acts in a similar manner to a truss in that it can carry axial forces and it can deform axially. However, it also behaves like a typical frame that you might imagine. Think back to your 130 class. So a frame can carry moments and shears at its ends and you can compute what those are and help you to uh, basically solve the whole system. So that's pretty much what SAP is doing. Except in a particular frame element by default in SAP, the element itself can carry uh, all forces, essentially. Axial forces, moments, shears, and torsion, actually. So there's a whole bunch of forces going through these elements, and that's already default once you import your sap frames like this. So pretty much at these joints, uh, these joints will be transferring moment and shear and axial force to each member that is connected to that particular point. Now, that might not be exactly what you want, say, in a model. Maybe we were trying to model this member such that it could rotate at this joint uh, and it wouldn't get any moment transferred to it in the major axis. So, for example, if you had a bolt going through this joint at both ends, then you would be allowing this member to rotate and it wouldn't be transferring any moment into it. And that's just exactly the case that we had in our bridge last year. We had just a single uh, bolt going through each of these directions, and it didn't allow for any moment to be transferred into the member. So by default, SAP will not uh, know that that's what you're trying to do. You have to be able to specifically define that, OK, well, I want the member to be able to rotate uh, at that point. How do you do that? Well, that's where releases and partial fixity comes in. So go ahead and select your member go to Assign, Frame, and then go to Releases slash Parcel Fixity. So here you'll have a menu that pops up, and as you can see, by default, no releases are in effect. So that means that pretty much all forces will be transferred through the member at both ends as well. So how do you can change this? Well, you can just uncheck this, or by default, once you check one of these, it'll uncheck that. And then, you can pretty much specify which ones you want to release. Say you wanted to have the member uh, carry no axial load. At either end, you could select both of these release uh, axial forces at both ends, and it wouldn't carry any axial load. But we do want it to carry axial load. The only thing that we're interested in at the moment is moment in, <laughs> in the 3-3 three, three or major axis direction. Now, you're probably getting confused with all of these 2-3s and 2-2s two and 3-3s three, 
what happened to our good old XYZs? Well, uh, here's the thing. So, technically, X, Y, and Z is great for the global coordinate system. So if we're looking at global coordinates, X, Y, and Z does this just fine. However, if we're looking locally to a member, it's not necessarily using the same coordinate system X, Y, Z. It'll have its own local coordinate system to the member. So how do we know what the coordinate system is for a given member? Well, there's a great way to visualize this, and you can do Control w our trusty old viewport command. So go ahead and bring up that tab by going Control w And here, we can actually visualize certain aspects of uh, our frame sections. So you can check out, maybe you want the labels. That's really nice. So this gives us the labels for each frame. Uh, we don't really care about some of these, but uh, it also helps if you already have releases assigned, you can look at those, but at the moment we want to look at local axes. This is what I'm talking about. So check it out. Oh wow. <laughs> so, so for this particular member, we have a local axis that's defined by these R, G, and B directions. So you can think of R, G, and B being the 1, 2, and 3 local axis directions. So 1 will always be in the uh, axial direction of the actual member. 2 will usually be uh, pointing up by default, I guess. And that's just the convention used, unless you have maybe members like this that are kind of on their side. Uh, but most other members, the major action, will, or I guess this is the uh, secondary axis. The 2 axis will be pointing up, and the 3 axis will be pointing out in this direction or something. So you can use this information now. Uh, going back to when I select it, say assign frame releases partial fixity. If I want to release moment about the 3-3 three, three or major axis on both ends, what does that mean? Well, it means I'm allowing my member to rotate, or I'm not allowing moment to be transferred that uh, would be moment about the 3-3 three, three axis. So that's about this uh, particular cyan direction for this particular member. So I can go ahead and say yes, that's the one I want to release. And as you can see, SAP already visualizes uh, releases by having these little green attenuated dots at the end of its members. So you can do that pretty much, and I'll just kind of quickly get rid of all of these because it's slowing me down. Uh, so we would want to do that for pretty much all the top chords. And in fact, actually, I'll go, for example, do Control g to select which groups you want to do. I can release all the chords. I would probably also want to do releases on all the decking, because they have uh, connections there as well that would, prov or I guess, uh, yeah, allow rotation, so disallow moment to be transferred. Same thing for laterals, and same thing for tendons as well. So all of these, I think, I would want to model uh, with releases and partial fixity. So I can go to assign frame releases partial fixity and release it in the 3 3 direction. So now you can see <laughs> it looks like I've kind of chopped my bridge up, but you know, highlighting it, you can see that still the member is there, and if you change it, you can just. Uh, oh, never mind. Well, <laughs> you get the idea. So you're, ta you're basically just allowing these members to rotate at it, their ends. Uh, now, there might be some special cases with the webbings that you might have to deal with later, but I would highly recommend doing this because it gives a lot more fidelity to your model because you're modeling it in the way that it will actually deform. So, hopefully that was useful. Go ahead and, if you can, uh, maybe practice doing this on your own model or take this file and then uh, maybe do it yourself or take a look. Um, get used to the naming convention for the coordinate systems in both the local and the global system, as we'll be needing those when we start analyzing our bridge and looking at forces. So hopefully uh, <laughs> that wasn't too long, but uh, I think there was some useful information there. So uh, I will see you next time, and good luck. Good night.